Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mark Michael. I'm the president of the Archaeological Conservancy. Welcome to our virtual lecture series. We're very pleased that so many of our members are able to join us in this uh, distinguished series of lectures. Our speaker today is Jessica, Jessica Crawford, the Southeastern Regional Director of the Archaeological Conservancy. She holds a bachelor's degree in English and a master's degree in anthropology from the University of Mississippi in Oxford. Her master's thesis was on archaic beads. Jessica has been working for the Conservancy since her days in graduate school and has been the Southeastern Regional Director for 15 years, where she conducts numerous acquisition projects, governmental relations in the region, and educational projects. She lives near Marks, Mississippi, on a family farm that mainly grows rice, soybeans, and cotton. Jessica. All right. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm looking forward to telling everyone about a project that I spent a tremendous amount of time on. Uh, I'm going to share my PowerPoint here. I think I am. Right. Okay, and I'm going to get my pointer out here. Now that I've figured out how to do this. Okay, this is uh, about the Troyville site. It's archaeologically, it's called the Troyville site, but it's actually located in Jonesville, Louisiana. And it's a, a place that um, we've spent a lot of time working with the Louisiana Division of Archaeology and their staff are archaeologists. And it's an ongoing uh, project so that we can try to preserve a site that we pretty much had thought was left, was lost for a long time. Um, you can see down here, it's, I've got the location of the site marked with a, a dot on the state of Louisiana. I'm going to show a couple more maps to kind of give you an idea of its location in reference to, to other places. Um, here it is right here, uh, Jonesville slash Troyville, and I'll explain the, the names in just a moment. Uh, right over here is Natchez, Mississippi, and it's you know, right over, um, there's the Mississippi River, and Jonesville, Louisiana is about 30 miles west of Natchez, Mississippi. And you can see there's a lot going on with the topography and, and the drainage there and, and all the riv rivers, and of course this is a really, really dense, I, I wish I had a, could put a dot for every archaeological site or every mound site just in this one slide, it would be covered with mound sites. This place was in, inhabited by Native Americans for thousands of years, and, and there's still still evidence of them, but we've lost a lot as well. Uh, all right, here is Jonesville, Louisiana, a little bit closer, and you can see that it's, it's at the confluence of three rivers. They come together to form the Black River. Uh, this is Jonesville right here. This is a bridge that crosses the Black River. Uh, right over here, it's, an, it's not labeled on the map, but this was an older community called Trinity. And of course, it's because of three, the three rivers came together right there. Uh, the, the Troyville site is located right in here. And literally, the town of Jonesville is located on the Troyville site. And it was occupied uh, during several time periods or by different cultures, but the main occupation is uh, Marksville and then Troyville. Troyville, the Troyville site is the type site for the Troyville culture. Actually, in the case of Marksville and um, Troyville, it's a site, a time period, and a culture. So it's, it's three things. Both of them are uh, well, we know that there was uh, occupation d during the Marksville period at the Troyville site. We believe from the little bit that we know about the site, which is not a whole lot, but we believe that the mounds and the embankments at Troyville were built by Troyville people, not during the Marksville occupation. But again, you know, this is, <laughs> when we've done so little excavation on these sites, it's it's kind of hard to say exactly 
who was responsible for each individual feature on the landscape and, and how long it was occupied because they're multi-component sites. But you know, as best we can figure, there's an earlier middle woodland occupation and then a later woodland occupation that was responsible for the mounds and the embankments at the site. One thing that does distinguish Troyville from the Marksville uh, culture and time is also um, the introduction of the Bowen era during Troyville. And the, one of the first descriptions we have of the site was from the Dunbar Hunter expedition. It's kind of the lesser known of the, the exploration after the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, they, these guys left Natchez and they went uh, down the Mississippi River and then to the mouth of the Red River and back up it to the uh, Black and then to the Washita River. And when they got to Jonesville or Troyville, they noticed this massive mound site on the banks of the Black River and they asked someone, there was some, a man who had a house there on one of the mounds and he was a Frenchman and he explained that he had been given the land uh, in a Spanish grant and that this was his plantation and he called it Troy. And Dunbar especially was really impressed. He was amazed at the height of the main mound, which we call the Great Mound. He didn't have time to stop and measure it and get you know, really, really good accurate uh, descriptions of the site because there were several mounds, there was an embankment and there's a lot of cane, a lot of river cane growing on it. So he was, wasn't able to stop then, but he did return and get some measurements of the site. And that's you know really the, the earliest description that we have of it. Um, let's see. Okay, this is this is a this map is sort of a com, com, combination of several early accounts of the site. Um, you know, there are different, there are a couple of different descriptions of how many mounds were actually there, but you know, generally we we know that there were eight eight mounds and seven were within the embankment and one was right outside of the embankment. Now this is sort of a regional map. There was also you know, supposedly a mound over here near Trinity and then across the Black River as well, but they're no longer there. Um, this is the, the town of Jonesville. The, plat, the town plat is kind of overlaid on this map. The only mound that is really still visible now is right here, mound one, which is right on the Black River. Uh, the Great Mound, it's kind of odd that usually the, the largest mound is Mound A or 1. In this case, it's 5. I'm, I'm not sure why that is, but uh, mound, the Great Mound, Mound 5, was supposedly 8 feet tall. It had two terraces and was topped with what was described as a uh, sort of a cone almost or a conical mound. And these are some some pictures of it uh, over time. It it suffered a lot. Um, the civil during the Civil War, the top or the cone or the conical top of the mound was removed, and it was used. The mound was used to, uh, to for cannons for defensive purposes during the Civil War on the river there. Uh, it was also this this picture here is those are actually tents for refugees during the 1927 flood. So, uh, you know, it was a common place for livestock and people to be during floods, which, and that was a common occurrence in Jonesville, and it still is. Now, um, it's not quite as bad as it used to be. Uh, this photo here is another, that's the Great Mound right there. Um, after, of course, the, the Conical Mound has been taken off of it. And then here at the bottom is another photograph of it, and that was taken during 1927 as well. Unfortunately, uh, most of what we know about the Troyville site at Jonesville is due to salvage excavations. In uh, the 1930s, early 1930s, uh, an archaeologist with the Smithsonian named Winslow Walker was traveling in the area and he was visiting mounds in uh, Arkansas and Louisiana. And he heard about uh, this mound at Jonesville. So he met, he got word of the site, heard of how, imp how impressive it was, and then made arrangements to return and do some excavations there. Unfortunately, he arrived uh, three days after the mound was, the Great Mound was completely destroyed. And uh, it was used for fill, for bridge. Um, this was, I think it's one of many uh, of the um, 
the bridge bridge is named for the governor of Louisiana, also often known as, as Kingfish, um, as it was the uh, I believe it was the Allen hyphen Allen was someone else, a local politician, Allen hyphen Long Bridge, and it was built in uh, I believe it was 1931 is when this bridge was built, and they took fill from the Great Mound to build the bridge approach. And it was the first, you know, really large bridge across the Black River, and it was a big deal for, uh, it was part of Governor Long's uh, bridge program. He built bridges all over Louisiana at the time, and unfortunately, the uh, the Indian Mound, the Great Mound at Troyville, ended up being a bridge approach for the bridge. It was sold for, I believe, $100. Um, Winslow was able, to, when, once he got there, it had only been three three days since it had been removed, since the mound had been moved. And I'm going to go back to this map of the site. So here is the, here's the great mound right here. Uh, they used steam shovels, wagons, all, anything they could, and they moved the dirt fill to the bridge approach, which crosses the, Bri the Black River right about here. And so it was moved, most of the fill, it was pretty much flattened, was moved from here over here. And of course, also, this was the embankment right here surrounding the site. Uh, when Dunbar was there, it was 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide. Um, it had been reduced considerably by the time Winslow Walker got there. But the Great Mound is what caught his interest because it had been pretty much truncated, just kind of cut off. Uh, the, brown surface and moves and in this cut he noticed uh, he noticed plant fibers he noticed wood he noticed a woven cane matting it, it, it was actually just kind of sticking up like kind of I think he described it sort of as uh, sticks of wood and, and matting and things like that stuff that he really didn't expect to see and he also described um, bluish colored clay in the ground. So, you know, it was all was not completely lost and he was able to persuade some of the landowners there to, to allow him to do some excavations. And he was also able to get uh, pictures and descriptions of the Great Mound as it was being removed, which he unfortunately missed. A geologist from LSU had visited while they were moving parts of the Great Mound and did give him some pictures and drawings and descriptions. But it turned out that, you know, where the Great Mound was, still there was lots for him to take a look at. Uh, and this kind of, it, this explains exactly what happened to the Great Mound over time. You know, it started out uh, at um, 80 feet in height, and of course the bay, base, and it was, Dunbar described it as 180 feet square. And then it was reduced to, uh, to this height in 1882. And then 1931, when it was cut right here and moved to uh, to make up the, the bridge approach. So it, you know, it, was, it was battered pretty good. And in the meantime, all the other mounds, which were a little bit, you know, of course, were considerably smaller, were also reduced because people were building houses. They needed fill for their yards. Um, you know, the borrow pits, there were a couple of borrow pits near in inside the enclosure. And when I say borrow pits, I mean, this is where the uh, the Indians who built the mounds, this is where they got the dirt from. So there were there were low areas from from when the mounds were built, from when soil soil was taken. And then the mounds were torn down and that was used to fill in some of these borrow pits. And of course, this is, a, this is the only picture I could find of uh, Winslow Walker. Although it's funny, I feel like kind of feel like I know him, and he spent his life doing salvage work and and you know kind of cleaning up the messes that were left. And he was really distraught when he got to uh, to Jonesville and wanted to work there and, and wasn't able to. He did have some time there, but uh, there were some landowners who who were convinced that he was there for treasure. He had to sign papers saying that if any gold was found, any treasure was found, that he would turn it over to the landowners. And finally, they just made it really so difficult for him that um, they just really weren't happy to have him in their yards. And, and so he gave up and left, but he did produce uh, this short volume and you can download it from the, uh, from the Smithsonian's website. And, and it's really, he's got incredible pictures of, of this, these woven cane matting. And, and here is some of it, some of the photos here. 
you know, these are actual logs here. And, and you know, it tells us a lot. Of course, it would help if we could see it now, but just his photographs and his descriptions tell us a lot about the engineering of a mound like this. Uh, you know, these were, were logs that could have been used or were probably used as steps in some places. It's, you know, it's, it's also hard to tell. Uh, this is cane matting, woven cane mats that were held in place with long wooden stakes. And, you know, they were still preserved. And this is something, you know, in the Southwest, that's not unusual to get preserved wood, but we don't get that here in the Southeast. And you know, in such a, a moist environment as Jonesville, Louisiana, the fact that this stuff is so well preserved is just, it's remarkable. And, um, you know, it's probably because there was the, the mound was built with, there was a lot of sand out there, but a lot of this stuff was in what was described as a bluish clay, a really, really thick clay. And that's probably what preserved it. But, you know, he describes matting with held in place with stakes that it looked like maybe this especially was part of a, a dome that was inside of the great mound. And then the mound had been, more of the mound had been added and constructed around it. And so that when it was cut off, even with the surface of the ground, he kind of got a cross section of this interior, what he looked like to him as maybe a cone or something. But, uh, you know, we just assumed that, that the mats were held in place for erosion purposes, but who knows, you know, it's, it's just, it makes us, we don't have that kind of preservation. And it does make you think we're, we're used to having, um, I imagine mounds as being like green covered with grass, just like they are now. And that, probably was not necessarily true. And it certainly wasn't at Troyville, but you know, there was a lot going on on this, it, this one mound, this one large mound. Now, a little bit of, of this type thing was found on the other mounds, but not, not to this degree. And so we have, uh, you know, Winslow Walker, he, he published this report and then pretty much we kind of wrote you know, that's all we know about the Troyville site. The town of Jonesville was platted out in 18, I think it's 1871. So until then, it had been known as Troyville after the plantation that it was on in 1871. The, the town of Jonesville had been platted out. You know, they got their bridge. It's a, It became a thriving community of a town and, um, you know, pretty much the heart of the town was right there where the mound site was. And by the time I started working for the Conservancy, you know, I'd read about Troy, the Troyville culture and the Troyville site, but I thought it was gone. I and, mean, you know, that's one that it was hauled off. It was, it was used as bridge fill. And there's a town on top of all the other mounds and you go there, you can't see them. Um, so I'd sort of written it off. It never occurred to me to take a look at it until we were approached by archaeologists with the Louisiana Division of Archaeology. Uh, Joe Saunders and, and Risa Jones, and they had started working in the town, and they were going to different areas on uh, in the in the town where where mounds used to have been, and they were doing coring. They were getting permission from people to core, do full so soil cores in their backyards, just to see if there was anything left of of any of this site. It turns out there was a lot of it left, and you know now that. I know where it is, where I know where the parts of it are. I, I know where to look and I, you can see it. You can tell a change in the topography. Um, you can stand on a road and look into somebody's yard and you can tell how it slopes up and you're like, oh yeah, that is Mound 3. But they confirmed it with, with coring and the people in, in Jonesville were, were kind enough to let them just, you know, walk all over their yards and, and stick cores in all over the place. And this map here shows the areas where um, where they confirmed part of the site is left. I mean, it's you really have to look hard. There's not much of the embankment left at all, except there is this little portion and this portion here, it's behind a car wash. Um, the Great Mound, it's, it's a slight rise and that's it. There's really not much evidence of it. Mound four right across from it is actually, uh, Joe said it was almost completely intact. It's probably about uh, six and a half feet, but 
you don't, it was just hard to notice because there were house, there are houses here or there have been. Um, and so when Joe contacted me, oh, and Mound One is still there and it's still there because there's a cemetery on it. This is the, the Methodist church is right here and there's a cemetery right here. So Mound One is still there and you know that's a common thing. Uh, a lot of times historic graves is, are what saves mounds. Um, the little bit of the embankment over here behind the car wash is still there because it's got some historic graves on it. It's behind a Presbyterian church. And so Joe, uh, Joe and Risa approached the Conservancy and said, why don't you, we'll give you a list of the areas in this town where there's still a lot of archaeology left and maybe you could, you know, approach the landowners and see if if you could maybe get some of the Troyville site. And and so the first person I approached, Joe, Joe felt like, you know, all of Mound 4 was still intact. And they were doing excavations, just a little test unit in the backyard there at the time. And so I approached the man who owned it and it had been in his wife's family for a long time. They were one of the earliest families in Jonesville. And um, they owned, actually they were the family that, I think they were the family that sold the the fill for the the bridge, and his wife's family was, and and she had passed away, and and he was getting on up in age, and he could not have been nicer, and was more than happy to, uh, it, and it did have a house. He was more than happy to work with the conservancy. There was a small house there, a small little house there that that no one was living in, and he was sort of in the process of tearing it down, and he agreed to sell it to us at a really steep discount. And so we we purchased that first lot um, on Mound Four. That gave us a really good, and it goes all the way to the back of the the block there, and it gave us really a, a good chunk of of Mound Four. And then uh, we were contacted by the Methodist Church, and they asked us if we wanted um, Mound One. And of course, it is. It's got a cemetery on it, so you know we're a little. You can be a little bit limited in how much digging you do in that area, but you know it's not completely covered. Uh, I think there's a little bit of the mound that may not have graves on it, but you know now that we have uh, ground penetrating radar and things like that, it's it's actually could be possible to excavate in a cemetery and miss a grave. Got to be really good with it. But so we agreed to take that as a donation from the Methodist Church, um, waited a few years. I, I tried to get this in part, this part of the embankment is is really, in, really intact. And what's nice about it is it does not have any structures on it. You know, that is the problem that we run into when we're trying to preserve a site that's in a neighborhood or a town is you, we have, have to deal with houses. Um, and a lot of times they're not in, they're kind of on that, you know, the brink of, kind of the borderline where you may have to um the, you can't it's going to cost a lot to make it rentable and it's going to cost a lot to get rid of it um so i really was this part of the embankment appealed to me because it is an empty lot and it's i mean you can tell that that's definitely the embankment um she has not been willing to sell yet so you know i've worked on her for a little while and but we st have still having two two uh lots there and then I think it's been two years, well, maybe almost two years. Um, we were able to get another lot here on this side of Mound 4 um, with the same family that we purchased the first lot from. And then there's a lot right here that we've that we got. So we and we purchased these. They have each has a house on them, and we are probably going to be tearing those houses down um, next week. And you know, these are you know, these are people's homes and childhood homes. And these are some of the older houses in Jonesville. You know, it's not it's not a thriving community like it once was, which is, you know, common for that area and common for the area where I am as well. Um, so a lot of these houses are empty or people haven't lived there in a while and they're not in great condition. You know, but they're still, you know, they're they're important to the people who grew up there. They're important to the neighbors. And it's it's a difficult Thing to do. I don't like tearing down these houses, but you know it's 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 a management issue, and and it, and it's just you know it, it has to be done. So so we're working on that now. We'll probably do that next week. Um, in 2009, this the Huey Long Bridge that was built in the early 1930s was replaced, 
And part of the deal to replace the uh, this bridge was that the, the company also had to demolish the original bridge. And so the Huey Long Bridge that was on top of the fill from the Great Mound was going to be destroyed. And so it was required that uh, there be some archeological work or at least some monitoring done as that bridge approach was, uh, I guess, dismantled or, or, or torn down. The new bridge was going right beside the old one. Um, but, you know, we we didn't, they didn't know what was gonna be in this field, maybe nothing. But so uh, we went there to watch the monitoring. This is it right here. Uh, this is when the you know the bridge part was gone, and this is the approach, and this is some of the fill that was moved from the Great Mound. That was uh, the bridge approach. Could not believe that actually there was still preserved wood there. You know, it had moved across town, moved several blocks away, and there's still wood. There's still cane matting. There's still a uh, there's still wooden stakes there and it is you know you can see how see the it was really it is dark bluish clay that that it was in this is one of the this is some of the woven matting this is the matting and this is one of the stakes that went through the matting to hold it in place we assume and, and it's just it's amazing to me that it didn't get destroyed when it was dragged over there this is another one of the stakes here um it was just, I mean, I've never, I've never seen anything like it. And it was everywhere. And, you know, it was, then they were faced with what to do with this, because, you know, this is archaeology, this is information. And, and so the town, there were some people in the town who got together and they decided it would really be neat to, to have a reduced to scale or to scale, but reduced much smaller. And I don't remember the dimensions. A replica of the Troyville site, built from the um, the fill that was at the great that was from the Great Mound. So they decided to, after they got the okay from from tribes, they decided to take this fill, move it, really move it a few blocks over to almost exactly where it came from. To, it was an empty lot beside the school then, and build uh, a replica of the the Troyville Mound site and it's um of course it's, it's obviously it's much smaller and it's plagued by um it's plagued by erosion issues but it's it's there it's still it's at an at a main intersection and you know it's and I assume that there is there's still a lot of this wood left in it I know that you know, the archaeologists took lots of samples but there was you know there, there was just so much I've just I've never seen anything like it and this is just another another map that's you know, kind of beside uh, Winslow Walker's Smithsonian report showing you know what was there and what is there now and it is it, it is just there are just remnants but you know it's it has taught me to never write a site completely off you know a lot of these places this is this area is it's, it does flood but it's it's it is kind of high but you know that's a lot of stuff is buried by flooding in alluvium prehistorically. And, you know, this this mound four, I was there when Joe Saunders was putting a unit in there and it was, it was easily um, like a meter and a half deep. And, you know, he was using the, the ladder to climb in and out and it was absolutely full of pottery. And at least with the case of mound four, you know, he believes that there was, there was definitely feasting going on. I know we always, that seems to be the archaeologist go to, oh, it was ceremonial feasting that it was used for, but there really was, that's, he does believe that there's some sort of communal feasting going on, at least at uh, Mound 4. Um, another one of the mounds did have one burial in it, and then there were some other um, burials that were found kind of right on the riverbank that were much later. They were like, it, actually, I think with the ceramics they were with, they were Mississippian burials. And some, I think someone told me not long ago, they must have been somebody who got lost because you, what, we don't have what we call Mississippian uh, sites down there. I'm, I'm seeing some questions. I'm going to have to, I may have to wait and see those because they just show up briefly and I can't, I can't see them long enough to answer them. Okay, let's see. 
right? And these, I just wanted to include some of the pictures of the lots that we have. This is Mound One, the one that's the cemetery that's right on the, the front street in Jonesville. This is Mound Four, and it had a house like right here in, in front. And it's, we see this, this is not that unusual in Jonesville and other places too. They literally buried people right out, their family members right outside the back door. So the, um, the family that lived in the little white house that was right here, that's them buried in the back or that's some of them. Um, and of course we had, we tore that house down. This house here and uh, right here, this white house is, um, it was once a beautiful house and beautiful gardens, um, lots of camellias and bulbs, just absolutely gorgeous. That's one of the ones that we'll be tearing down. Uh, next week, and and you can see like this is the so this is the road. This is my, I mean, of course there's plenty of mound left. That's that's mound four right there, and it's you know it, it's it's the height varies, but and this is really not the highest side. Uh, probably the other side is. Um, I went and this this is a, a collapsed cistern. That's that's since been or a septic tank. I'm sorry, that's since been filled in. That's what that big hole is. And this is a, a picture of that of Mound Four from the front. So like this this house is right next to this lot right here. So and that's all of Mound Four. And then we also have another house that is kind of on the back side of this. So those are the two that we'll be tearing down next week. And of course the tree here beside the graves is is no longer there. <laughs> it went down, it was taken care of not long after I took this picture. Um and so this is, uh, you know, it's kind, it's kind of ironic that the the Huey Long Bridge destroyed was responsible for the destruction of of Mound um, Mound Five, the Great Mound. But then also, you know, we did live to see the destruction of the Huey Long Bridge at Jonesville. Yeah, I think it was in July. I guess it was July of two thousand nine. Um, after we've, you know, after we stood around out there pulling wood out of the the clay mud, we came back and and gathered across the the river from Jonesville. And some of the bridge had already been taken down, but they did leave a section in the middle and kind of, uh, I guess, blow it up. <laughs> and and I'm going to see if I can play the demolition of the the bridge because it was, you know. To know what that bridge did to the Great Mound, to just kind of stand there and watch it explode again was was sort of satisfying. So I'm, I may have to take it off of this um, presenter view. Oh yeah, let's see. Um, just give me just one second. Yeah. It's not doing. Oh. It's not. Oh, Val. This, <laughs> I was going to let you see the, the Great Mound and explode, but um, I guess we won't be able to do that. So I, I've got time to take questions. I'm going to, I guess I need to probably exit so that I can see the questions or you can stop sharing okay yeah all right oh there it goes gotcha. okay I know I'm, I know that I'm all right so I need to open up chat Yes, I've sent you a few through there, Jessica. Oh, and someone asked when the Dunbar Hunter Expe expedition was. It was 1804. Oh, and someone asked why were there no embankments along the riverfronts? Um, and then is it because embankments were defense were for defensive defensive purposes only? We're not sure. Uh, I think a lot of times that. The embankments were just used to just separate, you know, as a sort of a barrier, but not to keep out enemies. And so I think, you know, of course, the river along the riverbank, that would have 
that would have served as it's uh, something to to separate the site from someone. So it's, but I think a lot of times these embankments or enclosures were were not for defensive purposes, but because you can look at them and and I mean, yeah, it would be difficult to get over some of them, but a lot of times I think they're just to to kind of keep a sacred spot separate from everything else. Only special things happen inside the enclosure. Okay, someone asked, is the blue clay found at the site and is it only found in the mounds or throughout the area? And is it blue because of copper content? And I sent someone an email today because I don't, it's it's from the river there. It's it's a local clay, but it you, they they specifically got this clay. It it was it's not natural, and I think they had to want to use the clay. And we know what now, you know, again, for so long, I just imagined all mounds were green, but we do know that that people took advantage of of certain colors of of soil and and um, you know materials so that then they wanted a mound to look a certain way, and colors meant a lot. And so I think it it occurs there, but they specifically wanted to use it. You don't see it just anywhere around there. Uh, someone asked if there is there any dye coloring on the cane matting? Not that I know of, but you know, I I don't know. Someone is probably doing some analysis. I can tell you that the um uh Louisiana, the state of Louisiana is gonna do a publish a publication just on the Troyville site. Um, the work that was done, the salvage work that was done there, they're also going to include a reprint of Winslow Walker's uh, book there. I'm writing a part on the work the Conservancy's been doing there and, uh, you know, all the help. And I do, I, I have to thank the people of Jonesville and the families that have been so generous to allow us to preserve their sites. And and it's, you know, I, I, I can't thank, thank them enough. And, and that's what I, I will include in, in my part of this book. But so if the analysis that was done on the artifacts and things that that were saved from the salvage work will be in this publication and it will should be available next year. Um, so let's see. Oh, someone said in embankment circumcise circumscribe <laughs> ritual space. Um, yet someone has asked, have you done hillshade light art date on the site? Yeah, I, actually, I saw that the other day. I had not seen that in the past, and it's I was surprised. Now, it could just be, you know, this particular LIDAR and, and what someone did with it, but I couldn't even, you can't even see the embankments that were there. It wasn't as, it wasn't as interesting as I thought it would be, but again, it could just, could have just been that particular image. Um, was any of the recovered wood suitable for dendrochronology? I don't think so, but I can't say, I'm not for sure. Um, someone said, uh, what kinds of external trade did they have? Do we know what they ate? Um, yeah, they, they ate local if there was subsistence existence, you know, hunting and gathering local things. Uh, you know, it would have been a lot of uh, fish, you know, that Jonesville, the town of Jonesville, it's known for its uh, commercial fishing industry. It's the only place, what I love about Jonesville, it's the only place I know of where you can go and get net knitting needles to repair, to knit, to, to repair the holes in, in your fishing nets and things like that. It's, it's a net supply place right there. So it's, you know, they, they ate a lot of fish, still do. They even they would ship it all over the country. I found some letterheads from uh, a Jonesville fish company that shipped fish to New York City. Um, uh, someone, let's see, someone said, is the Troyville site, the Lake Woodland type site for just the lower Mississippi area? And is this a type site for the style of pottery found? Um, it is, yes, it is the type site for this particular culture in the, um, in the lower Mississippi area. I live in North Mississippi and we don't have, we don't call it Troyville up here. You know, we call it Baytown. Um, it's, you know, it, the, the ceramics are a little bit different, but there are a lot of similarities too, but it's, you know, it's, it's just, this is that specific area and, and the pottery there's, uh, yeah, there's, there's specific 
Troyville pottery that we that we can recognize other places too. I mean, you know it when you see it. Um, but what we have up here where I live is, is we call it Baytown. Just like um, the earlier occupation there, the Marksville, we sort of think of it as a Southern version of Hopewell. You know, it's a little bit different, but there are a lot of similarities. You could tell there's definitely contact between the two. So, um, Someone says, how far from the river are these little Louisiana mounds? Um, well, the Troyville site is right on the river, pretty much. I mean, mound one is like right there, pretty much on the river bank. Um, but they're all they're they're all close to major rivers, usually. Yeah. When was the site abandoned? Well, it's you know, it's hard to say because it, you know, the the height of occupation was during a uh, the Troyville time, but there are there were some what is they call Mississippian period, and this means like people who brought in their um, kind of northern. We don't have in this part of Louisiana. We don't really call we don't call it Mississippian. Um, it's Plaquemine. There were there were some people living there later, um, like you know probably AD a thousand, but um, but not not heavily occupied like that and not anything like that and there's also a historic marker there that says Hernando de Soto died right there also but he didn't <laughs> there's there's not a, a proto-historic or really late occupation uh, there that we know of and certainly no evidence of de Soto being there um someone said is this related to the uh Oh, someone, oh, could we see the Saunders green map again? And yeah, I can put that back up there and, and maybe I can see these questions if I, um, even if I put this back up here. You should be able to open your Q&A on the side with okay. the little menu at the top. Okay. Okay, no, I think this is the, okay. I see chat, is that, let's see. Oh, I see Q and A, let me get that out. Okay, all right, so there's the, the map someone wanted to, to see. Um, someone said the broken pottery ritual breakage after feasting or accidental within the mound as it aged. Oh, I think it was intentional, probably intentionally broken is definitely. And actually at, at first there in this one, this one cache of pottery and, and he was, Joe was calling it a cache and it was something like 1500 shards just piled together. And at first he thought maybe it was an intentional cache of of pottery, but actually he thinks it was just, you know, the result of a lot of feasting and breaking and just, you know, being disposed of right there. Um, let's see. Oh, someone said, uh, what are the Conservancy's long-term plans for the site? I want, I would like, I would like to buy everything that you see on this green map that Joe labeled, and, and I have to say, um, Joe and Risa spent a lot of time there, and they were sort of my middlemen and women for the, the landowners. You know, they'd say, this person is is really nice, or you need to be, you know, be don't be pushy with this person, or, you know, just tell me different things. And, and they got to know the landowners as well, and, and they trusted them because they're good people. And but both Joe and Risa have passed away. And what I would like to do is 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 get everything that that you see labeled on this green map and preserve it with the conservancy. And um, we plan to put up some interpretive signs that does have mound trail signs, Louisiana historic mound trail signs. You can see actually they're shown on this uh, map. But I would like to you know have something on the parts of it that we own that interpret the site, what we know about it, and also pays tribute to the the families that that lived there and because you know eventually you know their homes are are going to be part of the what's left of their homes will be part of the archaeological record too and and so um you know I, I would like to have all of that you know preserved and and there's still so much research to be done there too and nobody has worked there since Joe was there and um when a, a 
Butch Lee, who did the uh, salvage work there at the bridge. Nobody's worked there since then. So there's there's still a lot of research potential. And, you know, I, I think um, I love the people of Jonesville, but I think Troyville might outlive Jonesville, <laughs> maybe. But uh, they can coexist, too. That's that's what I hope we'll end up doing. I want my next goal is to get the part by the embankment behind the car wash because it's it's suffering with erosion. Oh, let's see. Have you compared the wooden mats with the willow mats? Oh, that the U.S. Corps of Engineers has customarily used with for bank stabilization. I haven't done that, but I bet um, some of the people who are going to be doing or, you know, writing in this publication have done that. And, you know, that's that's exactly what we've assumed they were used for. I'm, I'm not sure what else they would be doing there, but I, I hope someone would do a comparison and we, you know, identify, you know, the, the different species and, and the plants. There are also, I don't couldn't find pictures of the palmetto fronds, but there was a lot of supposedly palmetto there, just layers and layers of it. Um, you, you know, you have to request these pictures from the Smithsonian, and I know that I know they're in there. We just hopefully they'll be in the the publication next year. Um, let's see. Did people live on the mounds, or? Oops, I can't see all of that. So I think someone asked me, "Did people live on the mounds?" I can't see the rest of her question, but. I think I get the, the gist of it. Um, again, we're we're not sure because they were partially destroyed before they've been looked at. But there are also other Troyville sites. So um, uh, some yes, there were there there have been evidence of of structures beneath some of the the mounds at other Troyville sites. But we do think um, for the most part, you know, there maybe one or two is a burial mound. Again, you know, one, there was one there that just had one burial on, a, it's just a layer of sand and then one burial and then, you know, sort of, sort of a um, rectangular low mound on top of it. So, you know, they were all different purposes, but it's, there's not a lot of like, um, it, it doesn't seem to have been a, a mound site that was occupied as a village, I guess is, is what, um, what we think there was occupation there, you know, before the mounds and the embankments were built, and we believe it was Troyville occupation too. So, you know, this, yeah, you know, they live a place, but for a while, live in a place before they decide to actually build um, earthworks. Um, can you yeah, see? Oh, do you have someone local to maintain the lots, cut the grass, and watch for problems? Yes, that's that is what we do, and that's what I spend a lot of my time um, dealing with. We have we hire someone to keep the grass cut, to cut the all of the lots, um, and to watch for problems. That's you know we have management plans for all of our sites, and and this is one you know where it's in it's in a town. We have neighbors, so we can't let the grass get out of hand, and so um, you know once we get the work done. Next week, uh, at at those two lots where we're tearing down the houses, the guy who mows the lot next to him will just, you know, add that to to what he does this summer, and and we'll get a stand of grass out there and and keep it mowed. But you know, it adds up too; <laughs> it gets expensive. Oh, so it says once a property has been obtained by the conservancy, do you have a range? Oh, that's what I just answered. So, so yeah. Um. Uh, any sense of population at the height of Troyville occupancy? I, I wish I did. I I have no idea. I just because we haven't you know, we haven't looked at we haven't done excavations at, on the whole site. You know, when Joe identified what was left at the site, he just did pull soil cores, just you know, little. I think he did like five cores all over town, maybe six, but. Or he cored on five mounds, five of the eight mounds that are still there, or that you know he could find, um, and so that just you know that doesn't tell you a whole lot. It just what he what he was looking for is is there mound fill left, is there or is it gone? Are you down have has it been scraped away to sterile, uh, to sterile dirt? So he was just looking for mound fill to make sure some of the mound was still there, and um, and you can tell you know when you've 
get through, usually when you get through the, the fill on top of the original surface. So that's what he was looking for. Um, oh, oh, thank you. Butch just sent me, and Butch is the guy that was holding the, the stake. He said none of the wood was suitable for dendrochronology. He was he did the work there at the, the bridge that goes across the river. So now I should just let him answer all your questions because he knows. Oh, someone said, what is the nature of the artifacts that were salvaged? Um, Winslow Walker's publication has, you know, there were some points there, some projectile points, and um, I believe some plummets or kind of stone plummets, or they're sort of like, they're similar to plumb bobs, sort of. Um, some of that and pottery, mostly pottery shards. Uh, but, you know, other than that, just not a whole lot, a whole lot of what, you know, you would expect to, or, at a, this fantastic mound site, um, but it's in. Uh, he's got some points and things. And then when we did the work, at, they did the work at the bridge. I think it was mostly, you know, what I showed you pictures of, but the wood and and cane matting and things like that. Uh, there was one complete. Well, it, it was restored. I think it was repaired. A um, a little cup or a little bowl with some in, in sizing on it. And it was broken, but it was you. Put, you could put it back together. There was a little um, effigy head that was probably was certainly on a on a vessel, like maybe on the rim of a pot, and it looked like a turkey vulture. I'm not sure. I don't know if we decided for sure that that's what it was, but it's certainly what it looked like. Um, and that's 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 about it. And unless unless uh, Butch can <laughs> can say something. Um, Um, do you, let's see, oh, that's, April, do you see something I haven't, now I'm going backwards. Oh, have you calculated how many hand-carried basketfuls of earth were needed to build one of these mounds? Well, um, I haven't. I mean, I, I know, um, God, if you, I mean, there are estimates of how much a basket was, and sometimes when you're, when you're doing excavations, you can, when you see the basket loading, you can, Get an, I mean, they, it varies in size, but sometimes you can get an idea of what size a basket was. But no, I don't, I have no idea. It was a lot of basket loads to make the great mound. But, you know, the others were, you know, they were different sizes and, and some weren't really tall, but, you know, still that's, that, yeah, that's a lot of basket loading. And I'm sure someone could, especially with the great mound, could probably figure out how many basket loads it takes. Oh, um, someone asked, uh, were there human remains here? Uh, there were when Winslow Walker was there. He did find some burials. I'm not sure. I, I, as far as I know, when um, when the work was done there, but when the bridge was being torn down or demolished, I don't think any were found. Um, I know that periodically in the town of Jonesville, I believe, they were doing some work, you know, down on the street, right on the river, right in front of our mound one. Uh, I mean, it was years ago, but a a child, uh, and this was a um, a child that was in a casket. It was not, you know, one of the Troyville people. Um, a, an infant burial was found, and it wasn't from the cemetery that we have. It it was, I guess, I don't know. They they found a baby's grave and they reburied it, of course, back there on the part of the embankment that's still left and. And it's just un the gravestone says unnamed child who was found uh, on Main who was found on Main Street or something like that. But but yes, there there were some burials there, but but not you know not a whole lot. There's some in Winslow Walker's report. Um, any astronomical alignment along the mounds? Not that I know of at this site. I haven't, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't really thought about it. <laughs> I have read it, you know, with the things that I've read about it when people have done work there, no one has suggested that. Oh, yeah, um, Janice, Janice asked, what was the matting used for keeping soil in place? And yeah, I assume that, we, that's, that's what I assume, but 
you know, it's like a lot of stuff in archaeology, you know, anyone's guess, but it was obviously it was these mats were held in place by wood stakes. So, you know, that's they would have been good for that. And I would think that this little the comb or the dome portions that it was on, you know, would there would be some problems with erosion, you know, with the slope there. Oh, someone asked, what is the importance of this site and why is it worth preserving? Well, heck, I mean, I just that was my that was what I just said. Um, uh, well, it's the type site for the the Troyville culture. It was in its day. It, it was there's no other site like it. I've never I've never heard descriptions of the site. I've never heard of the the architecture there and the the plant remains and the the wood remains. It's just it's it's unique. Of course, they have, but you know every site is. They all have something to offer. But this one is is I think it is really important. It was obviously one of the most important sites when it was built and when it was occupied. It was an important place. There was nowhere else like it. And people did this. You don't do this just for no reason. You don't build something like this. And you know simply because we don't know a lot of things about it and the fact that we thought it was destroyed but it's not there's something left is is why it's really important to preserve what's left of it a lot of times you think you can't there's nothing left just because you can't see it because you're just standing there but you know when you start looking a little bit closer and a little bit deeper there is a lot left and so um you know we've i feel like we've got a second chance with troyville and I think the family, the families we've worked with there, who's, you know, who, you know, years ago sold the fill for the bridge, you know, those are the, their descendants are the ones who have worked really hard and been really generous with us to help us preserve this site. So I think that's, that's pretty cool um, also. And uh, Butch said they found no human remains in the bridge fill. Um, have you considered using remote sensing to identify the extent of the mounds and other features? Oh, I would love. Well, that's again, that's why we're preserving this these places. You know, we don't we don't do the research on these sites ourselves. We we take care of we hold title to the sites. We make sure they're preserved so someone else can come and do that. Would love to have somebody come and do remote sensing. It's just you know that that'd be great. It would also you know Joe he did core a lot but and found what was left but you know there's he didn't get everywhere you know it would be great to to be able to do remote sensing it's I mean, so it's non-invasive and it's it'd be great to have that and you know it's more, more data more information about what we need to be careful with and what we need to preserve so you know yeah i'd, I'd love for that to be done it just won't it won't be me doing it <laughs> All right, I don't see anything else. I hope I got to everyone. I think we covered all the questions. It looks like we got everybody. Okay, and I will, I'll try to keep um, April and, and maybe the Facebook page updated when we do some work out there um, next week. And we'll also keep everybody posted on the, the publication that, that Louisiana will be putting out uh, just devoted to, you know, all to, to the Troyville site. And, and it really is, it, like I said, it's 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 unique. I've never seen anything like it, at least not in my region. Well, well great. Right. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Our next one will be on. Let's see here if I can remember. Sarah, what's the date for the next one? Do you remember off the top of your head? March 24th. Thank you. <laughs> in two weeks. Stay tuned in. Yeah, check on our Facebook site and our website, and we'll be updating that shortly. Thank you guys for coming. Okay. <laughs>